Welcome, everybody. Today, I wanted to promote is the fact that um, technology sometimes in the wine industry and specifically here in Bordeaux, and even more specifically in the top end wines, like the classified growth, um, needs also technology, maybe not to enhance or improve the quality of the wine because it's almost, well, we can discuss about this later, but I think it's almost impossible to improve that much the quality of the wines today. I think we reach a certain a kind of highest level of quality, technically speaking. But we can use the technologies, the new technologies, maybe to serve the storytelling. And you all know, you already, for the students here, you already know that we use the storytelling to promote something, to promote a brand, to promote a product. And to promote the brand, there is nothing else better than a storytelling, a good one. Because we are not selling wine. <laughs> I should not say that to you, but we are, I'm not sure we are promoting the product itself as a wine, as a juice, okay? Because nobody understands it. We, I think we understand 1% or 1% or 2% of the real consumer, wine consumer, know exactly what they are buying. The other one, they are buying a red one, a rosé wine, a white wine, champagne sometimes, and that's it. So, yes, we can use it to promote the storytelling, okay? And the fact is, this storytelling will be impacted deeply, I think, with two things. The context of an increased competition worldwide on all levels, and another context, which is the plethoric knowledge. Okay. So um, I don't know how would you imagine the uh, the meeting, the, uh, but if you want to ask questions, you can do Raise it. Your okay, hand. go for it. Okay. So can interrupt me as soon as you want. Okay. So the unrestricted competition. We can imagine that, and you read that in all articles and you test that as well. Everywhere in the world, we are producing good wines. And the quality of the wines worldwide, we, are, we cannot say there are bad wines in Rome. We are still producing low quality wines, of course, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in every country. But, on the opposite side, in every country, we also produce amazing wines. And the quality, even in some, what we used to call the low quality region, like languedoc roussillon which was known as a very basic quality region in France, it's not anymore. I'm sure as student, the young generation here, as a consumer generation, I'm sure you are completely involved in uh, the curiosity of testing the Languedoc Roussillon wines more than we did, <laughs> definitely. Believe me, yeah. We used to say, or our parents even more, saying Bordeaux first, because that was the wines, quality wines were known as Bordeaux, Rhone Valley, Burgundy, that's it. Okay. Provence, Languedoc Roussillon, Loire Valley, no. Today, Loire Valley is, they don't have enough wine to sell. Burgundy, Absolutely not. Languedoc wines, the price of the Languedoc wines are reaching sky high. The Rosé de Provence, you cannot find it anymore. If you want to create a brand of Rosé de Provence, and Magre, I know I have problems to, uh, uh, to get some wines to promote these wines, because they, we don't find it, and it's expensive. The Rosé de Provence, I would say Rosé de Provence, is awfully expensive compared to the Bordeaux wine. Okay? So yes, quality wines intensifies everywhere on the planet. So it brings a huge competition to us. But, uh, sorry for that. The distribution completely changed in the last years or in the last decade, better this way. Uh, it becomes totally fragmented. We are not, uh, well, we, we see in the last, I, I can, I can, uh, link these both arguments. Uh, the, the pandemic shows that um, what happened before in distribution, in one distribution, is maybe not true anymore. For example, we use, and if I'm taking the Europe 
completely as a market. Uh, more than 85% of the wine consumed were purchased in supermarket and hypermarkets. More than 85. It was the case. It's not anymore. And every year we see now the decrease of sales of wines in these supermarkets, hypermarkets. Okay. Good or bad, I don't care. <laughs> it's a fact. Uh, and this fact means that we can maybe use it to rethink the way to sell it, to sell my brand, to sell my, my product. We can use it to say maybe, okay, if we don't need anymore so much the big Carrefour, Leclerc, Rêve, Metro, etc., etc., uh, Sainsbury, whatever. Okay, fine. Let's find something else. Let's find other ways to distribute our wines. And again, looking at the pandemic issues in the last two years, and it really, really, really changed our way of consuming. And not only consuming, but also purchasing. We, we saw, and uh, sometimes it could be uh, seen as a funny uh, uh, growth or a funny evolution, uh, many chateaus in Bordeaux, very surprisingly, found that internet was a good tool in the last two years. And they slowly and, and finally found that only two years ago, or in last year, that, oh, internet could be useful too. And at last, I will say, that, because internet exists since 30 years now, and at last, they start to say, okay, maybe I can use it. And not only to show uh, how beautiful is my chateau, how beautiful is my cellar, and uh, how beautiful is my label, but also to show how can I sell you the one. And it changed, and it changed a lot. Okay. And you see that all the wine shops use the click and collect uh, uh, ability, all of them. And during the two years, and, and specifically during the, uh, the lockdown, I continue, and you could continue to buy some wines at one shop and click and collect. And I did it, and everybody did it, and it works. And it was perfectly well. In Canada, for example, you know Canada, it's a specific market because of uh, the monopolistic market, okay? And if we take the biggest one in Canada, which is in Quebec, SAQ, Société des Arts de Québec, this SAQ got something like 450 wine shops in Quebec, okay? The decrease of the wine shop was awful during the pandemic, and it still continued. But the website of SAQ increased of almost 100% within a year. Almost 100%. Okay, fine. Let's imagine that because it will stay roughly in the mind of every consumer that I can use it. And it's easy. It's easy because I've got it in my pocket. I can take it. I want it, I take it, I buy it. And I will receive it at home, even better, yeah? The other point for the competition is there is less consumption worldwide, except USA and China. If we took the wine consumption in Europe, in let's say, I don't like to say that, but old countries, or the first one to be organized, let's say that this way, etc., um, on this one market, the consumption decreased, not dramatically, but significantly, okay? We used to say that in France, we used to have 100 liters of wine consumption per year per inhabitant, yeah? 100 liters, 50, 60 years ago. It's not anymore. We are 44, something like this, 44 liters of wine per inhabitant per year, okay? Now, it's now the new statistic is per inhabitant more than 15 years uh, old. Huh? I think it's, which is, it was not the case before we, we were taking all the population, even the, the children, yeah? It's not the case anymore. But still, 44 liters per inhabitant. We are still the first one together with, I think it's Portugal. We are competing with Portugal in terms of consumption worldwide. But it was 100 liters. Okay, so it's less than the half of it. The only two countries now increasing their consumption of wine 
every year per inhabitant is China and US. Okay. In terms of USA, the big market is obviously domestic wines first, uh, mostly from California, but also all the, let's say, Hispanic origins wines. Because the Hispanic community, as you know, in the US is huge. So all the wine from Spain first, Chile, Argentina, <clears throat> it's an, a, a huge, uh, a huge boom, a huge evolution, a huge increase. Plus all the wine from Australia as well. Okay. A brand, you know the brand from Australia called the Yellowtail? You tell something? No. It's one of the big brands in, uh, in Australia. Just for the US market, this brand is more than 2 million cases. 2 million cases of 12 bottles, of course. Yeah? Just for the US market, for this only brand. And one of the biggest brands of Bordeaux, you all know which one is it, Mouton Cadet, probably. It's less than 10 million bottles, or roughly 10 million bottles a year, worldwide. <laughs> so we are small now. We become or we became small in this world competition. Okay. And the China, if I'm taking the Chinese market, we are still very lucky in China as a French actor. Why? Because China imports wine from all over the world, but the biggest importer is France. And in France, the biggest importer is Bordeaux, by far, by far. And the good thing is, if we talk about the big ones of Bordeaux, the bigger point is that Bordeaux exports in China mostly the big names, the high value wines. All the other countries export bulk wines, mainly. Australian, it's almost 80% of bulk wines exported into China. And those wines are later mixed together with Chinese domestic wines to produce specific brand of the Chinese market. If you tested already this type of wines, believe me, it's something special, yeah? But anyway, it works, okay. We are lucky for that. We exporting high value bottled wine, not bulk wines. And we are far away of the level of consumption that we can find in France or in uh, uh, other countries. I think it's roughly two liters per inhabitant per year in China, the consumption of wine, two liters. Of course, there are 1.4 billion, something like this. But imagine if they're going from two million to uh, two liters from 2.5, I'm not sure we can fulfill it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we can deliver it in terms of volumes because it's too big. So we can progress anyway. But less consumption means also bigger competition to reach it, huh? this consumption. Producing countries multiply their protectionist actions. We saw that in the last years. And one of the biggest protectionist countries is China. They are planting and planting new vineyards everywhere in China to produce their own domestic wines. Fine, fair enough but it's a competition. The US, they are multiplying every time, every time, some actions to protect themselves, to protect their domestic people, their domestic production. <coughs> the last time was uh, Mr. Trump, who did this 25% more uh, taxes because of a uh, nervous Boeing conflict. So why we, we had on the one business, the 25% tax because of a plane constructor uh, conflict? We don't know. Yes, we know, of course. It's just another reason to protect your domestic production. Fair enough, fair enough, okay? But it decreased dramatically the selling and the distribution of French wine in the country, believe me. In one year, it just stopped every distribution of French wines. Um, I was in US last summer, and believe me, on, I was in, on the East Coast, and in New York, the number of Bordeaux wines on the menu, on the wine list, in the restaurants, it's poor. <laughs> it's dramatically poor. Yeah. And it's, I cannot understand. So we have 
we have to regain this. The competition is hard. We have to regain it. Okay. And last but not least, each one region now is capable of producing top ones. We all know that. We used to say before that in Italy, they were producing basic wines in all region of Italy. It's not the case anymore. Look in Tuscany, in Piemont, in, uh, in Verona, they are producing amazing wines, fantastic wines in Puglia, in Puglia. Puglia. They're producing amazing wines. In Spain, in Spain, it was even worse. The image we have from the Spanish wines 20, 30, 50 years ago was absolutely awful. Uh, we used to, uh, to mix those wines with ours, produce volumes. <laughs> That's awful. It's not the case anymore. In Priorat, in Toro, in uh, Ribera del Duero, in San Duro, no, Ribera del Duero, in Spanish. Right. Uh, uh, we are producing amazing wines. In Portugal, in Alentejo, in uh, Duro, they are producing amazing wines and expensive wines. Look at the price of the Tuscany wines. Look at the price of some top pri uh, Priorat wines or Ribera del Duero. Uh, look at the price from Californian wines. I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to put a, a scale of values on the quality of the wine because it's so subjective. What I imagine a good wine is maybe not a good one for you. So uh, I cannot tell you that Screaming Eagle in California is an amazing wine. Maybe you don't like it. Okay. It's an amazing wine, but it costs more than half and you a bottle if you find it. If you are one of the lucky ones who can buy it. Okay. Come on. It was not the case 30, 50 years ago. It is now. And it is the same everywhere. Okay. And it's cool. And it's competition is good. It's good if you look at it and if you try to do it something else. Okay. If, no, no question on this. Do it now, huh? please. Okay. Okay, the second point could impact um, the needs of new technologies to reinvent yourself as a storytelling is the plethoric knowledge we have now around us, which is absolutely almost, I would say, insane. Uh, and I don't want to, to be seen as a, uh, what we call in French a vieux con, huh? but um, uh, I know that sometimes uh, it's too much. Too much information kills information, my opinion. Okay, invasion of smartphone. You're born with that in your hands, all of you. Huh? We used to. Now, as, a, an, a, as an adult compared to you, uh, 50 years old, we are exactly, we have the same use of this smartphone as you are. We cannot do without it. I need an information, I'm checking it right now. And I've got the, re the answer right now. The immediacy of answering the question is absolutely insane. You can find whatever you want in three clicks on your smartphone. And it's true for the wine. You want a, uh, an information on a bottle of wine, click on it. You will find it. You will find everything about the story, the, the family, the price, the distribution process, whatever. You will find it. It kills also the mystery of it. And it's not because you read it that you understand it. It's not the same. Because sometimes you have the information, but you are not prepared to uh, to understand the information because nobody explained it to you. And the processing of doing the wine, producing the wine, you can read it, but it don't, doesn't say to you anything. If I'm telling you that, yes, this first fermentation uh, and um, is made in, a, uh, in a wood and it's better for the wine because then uh, it will be uh, in a stainless tank, uh, for the second electric fermentation. Do you understand that as a normal consumer? Of course not. Believe me, 100%, no one understands. But you read it and it gives you information. Okay. The specialist apps, you all have some apps. I hope so there, by the way. Yeah? If you want to be uh, informed on the one business and if you want to study on that matters, yes, you should have some apps. 
whatever they are. What, what kind of app do you have, by the way? If you know. If you know, okay. One of the most known, I guess. Peloton, okay. What brings him to you, Peloton? Uh, it's like a Vimeo. No, I, I know what it is, but what, what does it bring to you? Uh, when do you check it? I need information about what? And uh, I need an order. Okay. So, but when you need an information about wines, it gives you the information of somebody else, yes? Yes. Okay. It's the test of somebody else. You don't know. But you, Im you imagine you trust him, I guess. I know. No, but that's the point. Okay. And all these specialized apps, we all have them. I think it's nice. It's cool. And I'm happy to have some as well sometimes. And um, I just want to, uh, to give you an example of a, an amazing app in China, developed in China by a couple of guys. We imagine that in most of the Chinese traditional restaurants, you don't have a wine list because they didn't drink wine before. Yeah? 30 years ago, you didn't drink wine in China. But because we are lucky enough to be there and to sell wines, all the traditional small <coughs> restaurants in China, they don't have a wine list. You can have beer and tea. That's it, and uh, baijiu, which is the, uh, the, the Chinese spirit, okay? And these guys created an app where in big cities, in the five biggest cities, I think it's the five biggest cities of China, wherever you are in this place, in a restaurant, you click on the apps and they've got the specific storage with a specific one list in those storage. And you click, you check, because you are obviously GPS uh, located with your phone and say, oh, close to your restaurant, you have this storage with those ones. Which one do you want? And 20 minutes later, you've got somebody with a scooter delivery the wines in the restaurant. Wow, <laughs> clever, super clever, okay? That's nice, that's clever. It answers a specific demand that doesn't exist right now in the market. Having wine in small traditional Chinese restaurants. That's clever, but it's another app and another one, okay? And we have to deal with that as a one producer or brand. We have to deal with that. We have to understand this. The democratization of speeches on the platform. Uh, I'm not, I will not explain what it is, of course. <laughs> you will know better than me. So YouTube, LinkedIn, WeChat in China, of course, you have so many people talking on the wine. So many, which is, who should I believe? No idea. Because somebody can tell me something, I believe it or not, I don't know. Because I don't know the formula. I don't know the technical uh, points. I don't even know it. Somebody will tell me that's good or not good. I have to believe it or not. My choice. So yes, I will multiply also on my smartphone to follow this one, this one, or this one. I don't know. But some of them, some of them and even the shadows are doing the same. We are multiplying on LinkedIn, for example, we are multiplying and we saw the multiplication of explanation of the new vintage, for example, or the presentation of the primer from some top wines here in Bordeaux. And sometimes it is a technical manager explaining or the general manager, or even better, the owner explaining his wine. Fair enough. And trying to democratize the speech to make it as a, lowest level possible to be understood by everyone. Okay, fair. But it is another point of knowledge we have to deal with. I would say, uh, and I will talk on under your control, Mathieu. <laughs> I try to be very pre present here uh, on <laughs> the rebirth of journalists. Um, I, I used to work from some top brands here in Bordeaux. And I was not always fond of some wine journalist. Uh, um, and, and some students here know that because I already told them. But by the way, you have some of them who try to, um, to make it different and to be different. And I, I was taking the example of independent, which is a new, have you heard about this lately? No? from uh, the former uh, cooperative person uh, from Robert Parker, which is Lisa peretti Brown. Have you heard about this name? No? Yeah. Okay. And Lisa peretti Brown plus 
uh, an amazing uh, Swedish wine photographer decided to create a new uh, media completely independent from uh, all advertising. So no advertising, only private shareholders decided to, and Swedish, mostly Swedish shareholders, decided to invest in this independent, which is the name of the website, uh, just to develop a new way of commenting the wines, testing and commenting the wines, and give some advice. No market points involved here. No money involved. Okay. That just gives you a kind of, yeah, my advice, my test, my personal perception of it, free of every relationship with the market. Does it mean that the others have some specific relationship with the markets and let's say financial relationship with the markets? Yes, sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's true. Not always, of course not, but sometimes it's true. If we take, um, we know that if we take some, let's give some names, huh? uh, James Suckling, for example, which is a renowned professional tester, journalist. If you want to participate to some testing with him, it costs you money. It costs you money. If you want to participate to the Hong Kong testing you organize every year, it costs the chateau roughly 5,000 euros. It's not much, but it's not little. <laughs> It's still 5,000 euros, okay? So we can imagine that doing this, we may have better comments if we give money, yeah? So the, the frontier, the, the border is very thin here between the fact that it's objective or not, okay? So we have to take that in account that some journalists, yes, try to rethink also their way of doing. And that's cool. And that's very cool. The last point, of course, the influencers. Uh, I was talking with some of them. You talk about Gulton, okay, fine. I met them. Nice people, nice guys. Very young, very active, very dynamic. They've got a specific way of thinking and they try to promote it as well. Okay, fair. But it's one way of thinking, yeah? Um, I spoke to uh, Emil Codens, you all know him, I guess, or the French, probably. Um, how many millions of views he has, this is amazing. Speaking of wines only, wow, say, wow, gosh. If he speaks about my wine, I will be seen by millions. Okay, as a brand, as a chateau, it's totally insane. It's totally, it's a, a tool we could not imagine 20 years ago. Yeah. You have to think about it. And if we don't do it, what can we do else? Okay. So TikTok, Instagram, you know that better than me, of course. But it's something we didn't have 10, even 10 years ago. Okay. Even 10 years ago. So we have to take that in account to impact our decisions to find some ways as a brand, as an estate. Say, so what can I do to, yeah, to be, to be there? and to, to act properly on my market and my distribution to, to find the consumers, all right? Still no questions? Sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, please. So when you are talking about the results of journalists here, so are we talking about specific to the wine industry? Yes, of course, of course. Just one industry. I don't want to talk about the other one. I'm not, uh, uh, we have a specialist here of journalism. I'm not, okay? But um, no, on the wine, uh, specifically on the wine, uh, I met some journalists and uh, <laughs> I will not give uh, other names, but I met some journalists. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, but I, I, I met some journalists and specifically at Chateau d'Iquem when they tested the primeur at Chateau d'Iquem, the, the reactions I heard from them were so, how can I say the word? without being so rude. Um, the reaction were totally out of the context and out of what you could imagine to say to, 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 uh, to explain a wine like uh, a certain wine. Yeah? It was out of it. 
but but mean, far away. I mean, they were they weren't uh, very prepared to face the became <coughs> imprimeur. Or... But when, when you say that the bottle uh, imprimeur, ah, it looks like oxidated. Come on, you know, <laughs> a sauterne oxidé. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, so okay, so I won't I won't give you name, but uh, I've got some in my head if you want. <laughs> okay, so you cannot say that. I mean, come on, not not to the not to the seller master. Yeah, you know? imagine Sandrine Garbay was like, a <clears throat> okay, fine. <laughs> you can't. And fortunately, and that's why I'm trying to be very positive. Here. Fortunately, I like that when the people in charge of it, in charge of this transmitting the message, they try to do it in another way, in a positive way. And that's why I, I, I took this independent, the new independent. So let, let's go on it. Uh, just find, if you can find it, Lisa Peretti Brown, independent. We'll see that's interesting, OK? So no other questions? No? People who are by Zoom also can make questions. I will read it. Okay. All right. Just any. Okay. You tell me if you want. Yeah. So the consumer demand, obviously, the consumer's demand is not the same anyway. Yeah. Uh, we just saw that this demand will be influenced and completely influenced by this influx of information we just saw. And you are the best example of it. Because I never checked before on my iPhone or, or on my smartphone. To, to buy a bottle of wine. I never did it before. My parents, even less. Yeah? Of course not. What, what is the fact, uh, what is the most uh, important way of purchasing a bottle of wine for the generation of my parents, your grandparents, for most of you, uh, was I like the guy who sell it in the wine shop. That's it. He's a, he's a nice guy. Okay. No? Um, my father is a good wine drinker, of course, and I used to bring him since 25 years, I bring him a nice bottle of Bordeaux huh, because, okay? And each time he proposed me to drink his shitty wine, sorry for the word, from uh, Sud Seven, <laughs> and it's, it's an awful wine, I don't like it. It's really not a good wine. Technically it's okay, but it's not, anyway, it's not a good wine. I said, come on dad, man, I bring you fantastic wines, Good value for money wines from Bordeaux. Say yes, but the seller is nice. He's a good guy. He knows me. Say, okay, fine. Fair enough. That's the best purchasing uh, motivation yeah? for these people. It's not yours anymore, and it's not even mine anymore. But as a junior, new generation, of course not. And as uh, you told me, yeah, Gulton, you will follow him eventually, eventually. But we. My generation, we used to follow somebody else. Yeah. We used to follow some big journalists like Parker to buy top points because we didn't know. We didn't know them. We didn't know. We don't. We didn't understand the products. So we had somebody to explain us. Okay, fine. And that's exactly the same for you. So if you want to follow Emil Codas, fair enough. If you want to follow uh, Lisa Peretti Brown in the next month, great. They will give you advice, but that will be her taste or his taste, not yours. It's okay, fine. But still, it influences now the demand as it was never before. Okay. The second point is it's also following the major trends, not only in the wine. And obviously, I put some example organic, biodynamic, vegan. I mean, come on. We are in these trends everywhere. You go into a supermarket and you see in all the shelves, in all the, uh, uh, the range, you see some green stickers, bio everywhere, blue or green. It's always blue or green. Yeah? On every type of product, you see these bio things or even worse, vegan things. Yeah? You see now some on back table, some of the bottle of wine, vegan wine, which is Almost all the wines are vegan anyway, yeah? already. <laughs> what do you think about the trend of uh, now, every chateau or every house is introducing wines? 
uh, they are trying to like uh, develop a huge range of different types of wine. Like uh, now we can see in uh, Bordeaux that they're producing a lot of rosé or white wines. And uh, in the past, they were using to produce what they were knowing and uh, what was the Italian wines. And uh, we can follow also the fact that uh, in Provence, they are trying to produce uh, red wines or produce something that they were not using to produce, to have uh, like a larger range, like organic, biodynamic. We think it's smart for them to develop with a huge range of uh, different specific products or Two, two possible answers. The first one is, it would be stupid not to follow the demand. Yeah. Okay. The second answer is, um, you are always good at something when you know it. So do you obviously have to be good in all the type of products? I'm not sure. Are we, uh, are we good producing rosé in Bordeaux? Frankly speaking, I'm not sure. 86% of the production of Bordeaux is red wine, 86. I mean, we know about red wines, yeah? We are the best one, one of the best one in the world. Okay, fine, let's do it. Are we good in rosé? Frankly speaking, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but it's fair enough. Okay, if we, if we have a market for that, it would be stupid not to have it or not to fulfill it. Okay, fine, let's do it. Are we good in white wines? Not sure. I think it's two or three percent of the production. A bit more, maybe six. Yeah. Uh, okay, six percent of the production. Shall we continue that? Yeah, we're producing some good white wines in Bordeaux. Yeah, some, some. At what price? In which quantities? Yeah. It's just such a small part of it, but it answers a demand. The demand on rosé is exploding. Okay, fine. Let's answer it. Okay, makes sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of risk because, like, uh, if the trend is not that uh, in some couple of years, uh, it's a huge investment for something that uh, we don't know in the future. It's, uh... oh, I agree. I also agree that, and um, if you ask my opinion on it, I'm not sure that makes sense to produce some white wine in Medoc. I'm not sure it was a good idea to produce uh, Cheval Blanc white. I'm not sure. I don't understand it. I know. Let's say that this way. I don't understand it. Okay, that's better. <laughs> I prefer not telling you my real opinion on that, but I don't understand the fact to produce a white wine at saint Emilion in Cheval Blanc Estate, which is known for, for Cheval Blanc. That's it. Okay. Anyway, but they've got a the market anyway because they will sell it. Even if it costs 100 euros, they will sell it. But still, this vegan thing, you know, it's just amazing. This bio, biodynamic and uh, all these organic things. Yes, it's just crazy. It's insane. We saw it, if we saw it everywhere in every, uh, I'm sure that we will find some uh, uh, car producer who will tell that the car is bio now. Sooner or later, it will come. Uh, I saw last week uh, doing uh, shopping, uh, I saw, um, some cereals it was written on, on the box that the cereal were uh, corn coming from a bio uh, an organic uh, field in the south of france or i don't know where and the eggs used to produce whatever in, in these cereals were made by uh, chicken uh, coming from this part of france and they were french chicken so, wow but i was surprised not to know that the the cock, the cock in english uh, rooster. Sorry? Rooster. Rooster, 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 yes. Uh, I wanted to know which country comes from the, 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 the roosters, yeah, because it was not written on it. Yeah? So it's, it's it's even worse and worse every time, yeah. We are going deeper every time. Yeah? Okay, fine, fair <coughs> enough. Fair enough, but we have to take that in account. It's maybe sometimes it's going from nothing to maybe too much, but we have to take that in account. The other point is the consumer demand compared to what happened 50 years ago is now completely volatile and totally versatile. You want to understand versatile? Yes, okay. So, and you are all again the best example of it. You test, you will buy this bottle of wine this week, next week you will buy another one. And an absolutely different one. Why? Because you want, because you are curious. 
And because your apps, because your TikTok, because your influencers told you that there is something new to test as well. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Again, fair enough. It's cool. But let's take that in account. And, oops. Um, this consumer demand benefits, of course, of the multiplier effect of the social networks. Before the social networks, it was not easy to transmit information. Today, within a couple of hours, you transmit an information worldwide to millions of people. The good information or sometimes the bad one. <laughs> so you can create a fantastic image of your product within hours. You can totally destroy your image within hours. Worldwide. Tough. Take it in account. How can you use it at the best way for your brand, for your product, for your wine? Not easy. Okay. Let's go further. Okay. Oui? Yeah. Okay. Now, being an 1855 classified rose, is that enough? Is that enough to, to sell your wine? Is that enough to promote it? You all know what is 1855 talking for the students, of course. Yes? Okay. So 1855, it's only 61 reds and 27 whites. Okay. It's nothing. I mean, come on. It's less than 100 wines worldwide. Wow. We can use that. Maybe we don't use it enough. The good thing is sometimes in some countries, and uh, let's take uh, again the Chinese example. When you go to China, Roughly, the first question asked when you are coming from Bordeaux is, are you 1855? It's not even classified gross name or nomination. No, we ask you, are you 1855? Fine. It's a good information to know. Because that means, that still, it means something. And it means something big, 1855. Okay, cool. Maybe we can use it again and differently or stronger. The Bordeaux bashing, it's not written here, <laughs> still hangs on. Yes. You know, this border bashing uh, could be seen also as, yeah, it's, let's say 50% our fault here in Bordeaux. Why? Because I think we are pretty arrogant on the market. As salespeople and as producing people. That's what I saw on the market. That's why, that's why I experienced on the market. And what that was, I, uh, I experienced also on my uh, uh, estate life. We can be seen as arrogant because we are sometimes very arrogant. First, we are French. We know that French people are arrogant. Yeah, okay. And we are from Bordeaux. And we are from the Grand Cru. The, uh, the triple, <laughs> triple uh, arrogance. Uh, possibility okay but still the border bashing is not only our fault it's also the fault of some others and you know it came mostly from i don't want to point it, these people out uh, are you from some of you are from england no okay cool so <laughs> but <laughs> most of the journalists and the importers in england they love to bash us they love to do it why? Because they don't want to pay too much. Even if they are making 80% of the business with us, they still don't want to pay too much for the ones. Okay. So they try to push, to push, and to put the pressure on us. It's a fair business. We don't like it. They love to do it. But that's it. That's the way it is. But we are not answering the proper way, I think, to this border bash so far. Yes? Uh, like, this happens in India where uh, when people, when Bordeaux wines come to India, they don't, it's it's said that um, Bordeaux people, they don't negotiate with their pricings and everything. They just... You know, the, the, the selling people from yeah, Bordeaux, they yeah, don't want yeah, to negotiate? Yes, yes they, they, they don't negotiate. If it's a Bordeaux, they, no one will negotiate the price, whatever they because, are. Because uh, in India, you are too tough in negotiation, no? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding yeah. because I know that we are not good in... I'm not sure we are very good in negotiation on these new markets as India, mm -hmm. which is probably the future of the wine market, probably. 
uh, hopefully when the tax will decrease yeah? because it's, it's too expensive right now but i'm sure that when the tax will go down in your country and and i and, and i hope it believe me i hope for it um then we will negotiate you cannot negotiate when you have a think it's still 200 oh yeah oh yes i think it's 200 percent the tax system no? uh, we cannot negotiate with that when you the bottle uh, leave the country at 100 euros here uh it costs 300 over there come on you don't have to negotiate it no? okay well, it's my way of explanation yes, yes, yes. i'm not sure i'm right um my other point yes pardon yeah i think there is another input you have to take into account is that the price is very high. So they don't, when, for instance, when you are in New York or in some other city, if you want to order, now there's so many of them to propose the bottle of wine because they think they're too expensive. So without this master, you and I, I mean, this process, I mean, it's the consequences of the highest price and in in, uh, in spite of the fact that you have made some criticism about the English speaking journal journalist, we have to know that the Parker has been one of the to promote the world of wine. No, I, I completely agree with the price issue. Uh, we all know that the uh, in the last let's say twenty years, the price of the top border wines increased dramatically. Yeah, uh, in a way that it never happened before. That. Yeah. Uh, uh, increase the price increase was uh, is completely insane. I agree with you, completely agree with you. But still, the point is there's still a market for these prices. Maybe not the same. And my point is to say that we are still trying to to sell the same wines to the same people, but with another prices. And it doesn't work. It doesn't fit anymore. Yeah, there is no match anymore with many of those. Traditional customers, they don't want any more. And as you said, and as I saw in New York, the restaurant, they don't want it because you cannot put a bottle of wine at three, four, five hundred dollars on the on the table. It doesn't match. And it's fair enough. But maybe we can find other customers, the one who can afford it. And we are, I'm not sure we are doing the good. Um, because you cannot ask the Bordeaux people to decrease or to divide their price by two or three anymore they will not do it be sure of that yeah uh, you cannot ask uh, uh, monsieur tesseron in ponte can it say ah oh, come on forget 100 euros and it will be better at 30 euros if, uh, come on guys who will pay my bentley yeah uh, of course so, um, but it's not only monsieur tesseron it's all of them they are thinking exactly the same so it's too much money yeah it's too much money they will not go down anymore. <laughs> but still, there is a public for these prices. We all know that now. Yeah? There is a new billionaire every 26 hours in the world. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 25,000 millionaires just in Shanghai. We don't even enough wines here in Bordeaux to fulfill these guys in Shanghai. So yeah. The point is, are we good enough to find them and to fulfill them? That's the point. And maybe that's the, the limit of our system today. My, again, it's my point of view. Huh? And I'm, I'm not sure that we are doing the good things to reach this type of new customers to, uh, to be sure they will pay the price we want. Because we will not go down with the price anymore. Be sure of that. <laughs> that's my point. So yes, the border system works or used to work perfectly well because we were at a level of prices affordable for everyone look these top ones in france you don't have them anymore on on table on the on the restaurants we can find some let's say what i'm calling the the right um middle of the range on the concrete classé. Uh, and the example i will check later on is chateau marquitam in margot so the first classified growth of margot this level of prices, roughly 50 euros a bottle, 45 to 50 euros uh, consumer price. Okay, That makes sense because it's an 1855, it's a Margot appellation. Okay, fine, that makes sense. You can afford it. And most of you sometimes can afford it just to, to please your parents or to uh, 
organize a, a group with three, four, five guys. We put 10 euros each and we had a, a, a nice bottle of Chateau, Mar uh, Chateau Marquiam Festival Gros Margo. Cool. We can do it. Yeah. I used to do it when I was 20 years old, your age, with my big friends in, in Versailles, in Paris. We used to buy the first classified gross, putting 100 francs each. Okay, 15 euros each. And it worked. I <laughs> could not do that anymore. I asked them last uh, couple of years ago to do that again and say, come on, oh no, no. I don't want to put 400 euros each. Yeah? No, of course not. So we, we yes, we, we were from 15 euros each to 400 euros each in 30 years of time. But still, there is a market for these prices. Maybe it's not the same as we still try to run today. That's the point. But the price issue is an amazing, obviously, it's, it's, it's a subject. It's a big issue. And talking to the British, uh, and I don't want to come back on the English guys, but uh, when you talk to the big importers in England, they always try to push on the prices. And believe me, they, they try hard. And when they put the pressure on the, on the merchants here in Bordeaux during the premier session, etc., believe me, they put pressure as they can do it. Because they're coming and say, okay, I, I want to buy 10,000 cases of premier, but I want this price. You're keen to do it when you're a merchant because you want this 10,000 cases of order. Yeah? But the price is down. Still, the point is, these big importers, they are making their business at a level of 75, 80% with, with the border wise. With the border wise. So we are making the fortunes. <laughs> we are in border. And they are taking a couple of percentage margin on it. Three, four, five percent. Not more each time, not more. So the point is the highest we are on prices, the better is the margin. So they still bash us, but we are making their fortune with our higher prices. So that's why sometimes I'm saying that the English importers are sometimes a bit hypocrites with us, sometimes, okay. But price issue is a one, a good, good one. If we were clever enough, maybe in Bordeaux, to try to imagine having new customers and not trying to push always the same customers to push them to accept new prices, which they can't because a restaurant they cannot afford it. How many restaurants now wants to buy in Primeur, the big ones? No one. They can't. They can't put so much money hidden in the cellar for the next 10 years. They can't. All the big restaurants in France, in Europe, everywhere, they used to have Primeur. The best one is Primeur for many years. In Switzerland, in Germany, that was amazing. You had the cellar in um, uh, uh, Beaurivage, in, in Geneva, etc. That was the cellar was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Louis XIII in the um, uh, Louis XV, it's called in Monaco. Uh, the cellar is was completely insane. Everything was bought in primer for years, 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 and years. They don't do it anymore. Cost too much money for nothing. Yeah. So that's it. Maybe okay. Maybe some find some new markets, new customers with these prices. Just to answer your issue uh, question. The thing is, we still have to get off the ground and yeah, answer the demand. My point is to find a point of differentiation. We have, as I said, uh, roughly 100 Grand Cru 1855. Okay, fine. How can I be different? To, to show me different and not to be like the other ones. So why me and why not the other ones? Specifically in the Margot appellation which is one of the biggest Grand Cru appellation. So you have so many, same kind of wines, same kind of prices on the market from the Chateau coming from Margot as a Grand Cru Cassé, you have almost 20, yeah? Which are between 35 to 100 euros. How can I be different from that? How can I show me different? Not easy. And my last point, to be uh, 1955, is it enough? Robert Parker. Robert Parker was a big point. If we were fair play in Bordeaux, I think we should raise him a five meter high statue on Place des Quinconces. 
that would be fair. Yeah? He made the fortune of Bob, I think, yeah? in the last 35 years, 40 years, 40 years now, 82, 30 years. <laughs> so he made it, but not anymore. He's not testing the wine anymore. Okay, fine. You know, during all the last 20 years, I was trying to sell wines all over the world. The only way of selling the wines from the merchants in Bordeaux were to put the name of the Grand Cru, let's say Chateau Marquitaire, the vintage, the number of cases available for this customer, the price, and the last point was Parker note. That's it. No other argument to sell the wine. No story, nothing. Parker point. That was, that was RP. No, that was just said price and just beside the price, RP. That was it. You said everything or nothing. It's not the case anymore. So we have to find something else to sell our wines. And every year now, if you want to sell our wines, if you want to promote the wines during the premier week, we have to tell something else at just Mr. Parker gave us uh, 92. Wow, fine. No, it doesn't exist anymore. You still can say that Jen Hanson give you this, that uh, James Stuckling give you that, if you pay the 5,000 euros. <laughs> uh, you can say that uh, Galoni gave you this note, et cetera, et cetera. You can promote and multiply the number of notes you get. No one, and even if you multiply and you add all these uh, testing notes together, it will never reach the level of influence Mr. Parker had to just one comment on one. Never. I saw and I experienced the fact that when he gave a note, suddenly, yes, you saw you sell your wine within an hour worldwide. It's sold and it's sold out. The demand is twice, three times the production you have just because he gave you a 98. And that's it. And if, if he gives you 100, you can not even answer the phone because it's still ringing and ringing and ringing during the week. It's crazy. Yeah. And you can have some people, buyers from Auchan, from Carrefour, from Metro, calling you and asking, oh no, I don't care about the price, find me some. You know, come on, guys. Insane. Nobody will tell you that with Jen Hanson or with uh, Galani or with, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for them, but that's the reality of the market. So it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, fine. Let's reinvent yourself. Then. If you don't find a note, if you don't have a note, a comment, of somebody so influent on the market to help you, let's find something else. Give your story at last. Finally, you can say something else. And it's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity also for you students coming on the market to try to be the guys who will promote it this way. Who will be the next maybe selling people or marketing people to promote the new ideas and new stories. What? No question on that? No? A few examples. We know that some big names in Bordeaux follow the trends or try to um, adapt themselves to the trends. But what we said so far, yeah? Chateau Latour defined himself as a bio wine. Okay. First words of Poyac. Wow. Cool. Doesn't have the, the green point on it, but still he defined himself as a, a chateau made in organic wine. Cool, makes sense. Fonte Canet, which was the first one, top brand of classified 1855 uh, as a biodynamic wine. Yeah. Cool. Is it a good way? Is it a bad way? I don't care. Were they right to do it? Frankly, I don't know, and I don't care. The thing is, it was clever to do it. Clever to do it because of the market. And Fonte Canet, in US, by the way, is quite appreciated because of this. And they got a lot of articles on that. And they were the first one to be so close to the biodynamic things. So they got so many articles and they pointed them out, hey, I'm so different as you guys. Fair enough, and clever. Your for Vivins, Ferrière, which are also uh, Grand Cru from Margot, by the way. And they're also in bio, in organic and biodynamic as well. Okay, and it works. It's new way of doing them, 
or of, of explaining their business on the market. It's definitely a new way of producing the wise. Okay, fine. But roughly not so different as what they did before. The thing is, yes, we are showing ourselves different. If you buy my wine, you are not buying a normally classified growth of Margot, you are buying a biodynamic or an organic classified growth of Margot. That makes a difference. And if we are checking, if you are checking your apps, you will see, oh, it's an organic classified growth. Makes sense. Okay. Maybe not for me as a consumer. I'm not the target. I am not. And you're not. We are not the targets, I'm sure. But they are the targets. You are definitely the target so far. Okay. And okay, last but not least, I took market term, which is the first classified word from Margo. Why? Because I know the metal quite well. And uh, yeah, and they did uh, some uh, some nice experiences, some nice um, evolutions. And they want to make evolution. They want to organize evolution in their in their cellar, and many in their cellar. Why? There is a context. The context is it's a family business. It's still a family-owned estate as a classified rules. Since uh, 90, almost 90 years now, right? the family Sene Claude, okay? which is a wine family from the old years in Algeria. But fair enough. And they, they did a big thing. And they, they, they are very close to the Chateau de Famille. They're not living here. They live in Paris and Marseille, but still. They are very close. They come every month to spend two, three days in the chateau and discuss with all the personal inside. Stuff. Like, it's okay. They are very close to it. And they want to make it at the best possible way with their own financial possibilities. They are not Chanel, they are not LVMH, they are not Brig, they are not uh, Pinot, which are also owners in Bordeaux, as you know. And they, they are not limitless. They are wealthy, no problem. A wealthy family, but not that much. They, they've got limits. And they intend to put some limits to their chateau as well, but try to make it different. So they decided to hire um, 12 years ago or 13 years ago to hire a new technical manager, a new general manager. And uh, this general manager was coming from uh, Banamaga, by the way. Uh, he was first at Chateau Fombrouge and then at La Tour Carnet. And he decided to change things you know, with the family, of course, uh, but to change all the things, not only in the vineyard, but also in the cellar. So they renew it completely and the vineyards and the cellar, just to make things different. And believe me, if you taste the former wines from Chateau Marquitern before 2011, which is the first vintage of this new team, and you test all of before that, they are not the same one. It's not the same style. It's completely different. And my test, yes, the wine improved in quality, definitely, and strongly. Not for a higher price. <laughs> okay. So not only they innovate, and we will see that together, they decided to explain it. To explain the story, to give something to the customers, and not only to uh, make their own kitchen in the cellar. No, let's show it. Let's be transparent completely. We want to explain. We want to show what we are doing because because we are proud of it, and because at last we have something to say to it, <laughs> and that that makes sense. Okay. So in the cellar. In the cellar, they are trying almost everything possible we can try as innovations in the way of producing the wine. You know, there is no secret to produce a wine. Wherever you are in the planet, we are producing the wine roughly the same way. There is no secret. We are not uh, talking about nuclear weapons. Huh? We are talking about wine, something we are drinking. So there is no secret. That's why they are also decided to show something and to show everything, to be completely transparent. Just because, okay. So the first thing is a pearl, what we call the pearl made by Quintessence. Quintessence is a big uh, cooper here in, uh, uh, in Bordeaux and coming from States. 
It's a wood bat, a small, far small, not a small bat. Right? It's uh, almost four hectoliters. Uh, it's a completely vinification integral under pressure in wood. And um, it has an interest mainly when you test it. I, I've made this, I, have you tested all these things directly from a... Uh... No, not from me. Uh, okay, okay. Because that's, that, that's the funny thing when you do it with uh, with the Vikis. Yeah, you should, you should do that together. Anyway, next time. Uh, Ludovic David, the general manager, decided to, to test it because he brought to the fruit a huge density he didn't find when he used to vinificate in stainless or in a uh, um, beton tank. Yeah? So, and finally, this way of doing, of processing the vinifications, give an intense fruit to the wine. A really intense, very strong, very deep, which was not the case he used to have before. So you will multiply these experiences with this device. Okay, you will he wants to do it. We talked last week about it, and he really he found it absolutely amazing. He's not he's not the only one. Huh? I was in Saint Emilion as well at Chateau Trollon Mondo, the first specified growth of Saint Emilion. They also tried it, and they also had the same results in the intensity of fruit. The wine glove made by Petzolz, yeah? It's, it came from, uh, do you know the name Damjan? Yes, yes. yes? okay. Uh, which was this big glass bottle uh, of, usually it was uh, 70 liters roughly. Uh, you find some still um, in Roussillon. If you go to, um, to Mori, in Roussillon, in the, in the mountains, uh, you find some huge fields of Damjan directly outside <laughs> under the sun, and you have the one inside aging, or it, it's fun, it's, it's, it's very nice to see, yeah. Okay, and here they're still fermented inside the globe, okay. So the one at, uh, at the chateau is the small one, 220 liters, but they are trying to promote a new one soon, which is 400 liters. It's not on the market yet. It exists since last year. So it's a very new try uh, for, the, for the Chateau to do it. And again here, uh, you can vinify, raise, and storage the one in the same uh, place, in, in the same uh, batch, okay? What said Ludovic David on that is the purity from the grape you have here is amazing. It's absolutely amazing because you have no other taste of it. You don't have the wooden taste. You don't have all the tannins from the wood coming into uh, the process. It's just fruit 100% only. Okay, fair enough. And uh, so far, one of the, let's say, Negative points, <laughs> the price. It's quite expensive, <laughs> quite expensive. But also why? Because it's so new and there is so little on the market, so few on the market. Maybe if it develops, the price will obviously decrease, yeah? but so far it's quite expensive. Okay. Alma, which is a very new, uh, element from uh, a cooper called Baron, Baron Cooper. And this Baron Cooper uh, decided to make um, two types of products in the same barrel. So 25% in gray here on the bottom and the rest in wood, in oak. So it will give the process, uh, yeah, a kind of alcoholic fermentation two in one. So you will have the two effect or the two impact from gray plus wood at the same time. It's a very new try at the Chateau from this year. So they don't have the result yet, but they imagine and they hope so that it will reveal the minerality of the gravel 
because of the gray. And uh, it could work, that's the expectation, by the way, <laughs> of the linearity of the one. They hope that. But again, it's quite expensive as well because it's produced in such a small quantity that it doesn't make sense to make that uh, in all your cellar so far. The eggs, the eggs are not so new anymore. Look at the cellar of Chateau Ponte Canet. It's amazing, yeah, beautiful. But still, it's raw concrete, complete inertia, uh, inertia of temperature, fine. And uh, when I'm saying, I'm saying uh, totally inverted, that means compared to the, the way they used to produce the wine at Chateau Marcoutem, they dedicated this X to produce a very specific cuvee called the nine, the neuf. Oeuf, eggs, neuf, wow. But still, <laughs> so, and it was to exactly the wine will be not only uh, fermented here, but also aged in this mix. And uh, to say the truth, I opened a bottle yesterday evening <laughs> with my wife of the Neuf from Chateau Marquitem, vintage 16. And the fruit of the wine compared to a Marquitem is absolutely different, it's not the same. But the complexity is not the same as well. It's totally different. And if I'm comparing the two, the complexity of market term is definitely higher. There is no comparison. Anyway, but it's a good try. And last but not least, at Chateau Market term, they're using this new, uh, what we call amphora, called Tava. Um, it's, in a, it's an Italian producer of gray as well. Um, the one on market term is 750 liters, which is quite big. Um, again, you've got a thermal inertia, which is amazing. It's a micro pore. That means you have an exchange with outside oxygen, like in with the wood, without the tannin of the wood, without the other taste of the wood, the other aroma of the wood. So it choose to alleviate the problems of wood because we try to anticipate, and some chateau try to anticipate the tension you have on the wood uh, distribution so far. We have a big tension. If you want to have some barrels, some stuff, it starts to, to be difficult. You know? There is a huge tension on this, on the market so far. So it could be a solution to replace it. It could be. Or at least to, to make it a part of it, just to be sure we don't uh, be so much impacted by this tension on the wood situation. Okay. Some conclusions. Um, at Chateau Market Term, and I'm, I really take this, take this example because they really want to show something. Um, they are small. It's not a big name on the market. It's not a brand well known, famous like Chateau Margot or Giscourt. Giscourt is well, well known, famous. No problem. Yeah. Market term. Did you know that before? Not sure. Yeah. So they need to do something else. They need to tell something else. And they are ready to open the doors and say to show everything. And not only to the consumers visiting them but also to the other producers. I know that because when I was there last week or two weeks ago, um, the technical manager from Chateau Calon Ségur was there to, he wanted to see all these new things because he didn't do one of them. So he wanted to understand it. And Ludovic David explained everything. I said, yes, we did this, we did that, we tried this. We are happy with that, we're not happy with that. There is no secret. We are not dealing with defense problems. We are doing wines. Come on, let's do your wines. Yeah? And first, and, and almost, whatever you are doing in the cellar, everything coming from your soil, from your terroir first. If you are the good one, that will make a good one anyway. Yeah? If you don't, sorry for you. <laughs> you will. Whatever you are taking in your cellar, it won't be a good one. So that's it. Um, the, the, the commitment of this chateau is to explain everything. 
just to, yes, let's show me different. I want to be different. I want to show that I can give something to the consumer. I can explain in such a storytelling, such a, a nice story, different from the other one, different from my fellow Grand Cru of Margot. And cool, let's go for it. The other point is, it's a willingness to show the new experience, to tell the why and the how. Because that the why is something some of the consumer can understand, but the how is more dif yeah, sometimes more difficult to be understood by the consumers. And they take time, believe me, they take time. All the visits, they really take time to explain all these new experiences. And I think the visitors are always, always very felt surprised and enthusiastic to them. And the last point is they decided to completely integrate these speeches of innovations and the use of innovations, and they explain why they use it, not only to the one visitors, but mainly to the unauthoristic uh, opportunity they have in Chateau Marquette. They got a dedicated team for the unauthoristic things, and they all are uh, formed to be really, really keen on these specific innovation processes, because now it's part of what we used to call the DNA of the brand. The DNA of the brand of Chateau Marquette now will be, I am an innovative wine and we want to be different. And it doesn't make a different wine in terms of classified gross quality. We are still a 1855, but not anymore. We are not only a 1855 anymore. We are that plus that and that and that and that, okay? All right? That's why sometimes innovations, yes, to change the story or to improve the story. That's it for me. If you have questions. No? Okay. Thank you and for the attention. On the other side on the screen.